DMM, or direct metal mastering, marked the final evolution of vinyl technology before the takeover of the CD. And although out of fashion today, DMM is capable of producing some truly great sounding records. In this video, we'll be looking at the history of this groundbreaking technology and find out with the help of some classic Beatles vinyl, whether they sound better or worse than regular lacquer cut pressings. Also, in a first for this channel, we'll be doing a gear review of a wonderful sounding new cartridge from Pure Fidelity. Whether you're intrigued or confused, welcome along. I'm Andrew from Parlogram and allow me to explain direct metal mastering. As the 1980s dawned, the record industry was changing. Vinyl sales were falling, cassette sales were increasing, and the digital revolution was just around the corner. It was clear that vinyl couldn't compete with the convenience and portability of the cassette, but it could at least put up a fight by improving its sound quality. So in 1982, two German companies, Teldec and Neumann, got together to invent something that they believed would bring the sound quality of vinyl up to the level of the CD, and at least give it a run for its money. And they called it Direct Metal Mastering, also known as DMM. DMM was a completely new analog audio disc mastering technique, based upon a system which RCA had been using with their Selectivision discs in the late 1970s. Now DMM cuttings are not cut onto a lacquered covered disc like this, but onto a stainless steel disc, which is coated with copper. DMM was launched by Teldec at an international technical conference in 1982, after which licenses to use the technique were sold to whichever company wished to use it. And one of the first companies to embrace DMM was EMI, who introduced it to their main Uxbridge Road plant in Hayes in 1984. Their engineering team went to work immediately, building facilities not only to manufacture copper blanks for themselves, but also for sale to cutting studios throughout Europe and the USA. It's easy to see why EMI was so taken with the DMM process. For a start, they didn't need to grow a master or positive from a lacquer, because the stampers could be grown directly from the copper disc time after time, as they didn't wear out anywhere near as fast as lacquer cut discs. As well as benefiting record companies, DMM promised advantages to the consumer too. Longer programming lengths on each side could now be achieved without the risk of jumping or sticking. DMM would also eliminate end of side distortion, as well as post and pre echo. By the late 1980s, despite the technological innovations of DMM, the writing was on the wall for vinyl and for the factories that produced it. RCA had ceased manufacturing vinyl in 1981. Then in 1987, Polygram closed their plant in Walthamstow leaving EMI to take over pressing duties for both companies. In fact, by the early 1990s, EMI's Hayes factory was producing 68% of all vinyl records sold in the UK. But vinyl's steady decline continued, and in 1992, EMI were forced to close their pressing plants in both Milan and Cologne, which left only Dum Dum in India and Brazil as their only vinyl production facilities. Today, Vinyl production has re-established itself, and DMM has become a popular method of production in Europe with companies like GZ in the Czech Republic. But whilst DMM's more streamlined process suits the pressing companies, it's one which is not universally liked by the customer. So why is that? Well, DMM by its nature is a more precise cutting system which produces sharper transients, which can be perceived by some as being brittle and thin sounding. The lacquer cut, on the other hand, fits more into the narrative of what people think of as being the traditional sound of vinyl, i.e. smooth and warm. Now some of that may be true, but sometimes it's just down to the mastering style of the late 1980s and early 1990s, the era in which DMM first appeared. But with the right kind of mix and music, it can sound terrific. For example, Tracy Chapman's 1988 debut which was cut with DMM sounds fantastic and because of that, original copies today sell for a premium. 
So how do you know if you have a vintage DMM pressing? Well, the chances are, if you bought an EMI pressed record in the mid to late 1980s, it's going to be a DMM pressing. For example, the first pressing of the Beatles' Past Masters was a DMM pressing, as was this superb Hollis compilation called All the Hits and More, both of which date from 1988. Now, I bought these Sinatra and Nat King Cole albums in 1986, and they're both capital DMM cut pressings. And they both sound clean, clear and detailed, which is no surprise because they were great recordings in the first place. Now, some jackets like these Capitol albums helpfully have the DMM logo printed on the back. But if they don't, you might have to look a little closer at the vinyl itself to know if it's DMM. One of the main indicators is at the edge of the disc. On lacquer cut discs, the edge has a kind of lip to it. Whereas the DMM pressings have a very flat edge profile. DMM discs are generally very light and the grooves are much shallower than on a lacquer cut pressing and they give the playing surfaces a very smooth, almost glass-like finish. But the smooth surface of the DMM disc does make light scratches and bag rash from the inner sleeve more visible than on a lacquer covered disc, which can hide surface wear more easily. But don't be put off, the grooves are very robust and a little surface rubbing doesn't usually affect the sound quality. Now I did, at the start of this video, promise you some Beatles content. So let's take a look at some of their albums on DMM and how they sound. Now to aid me in this quest, I'm bringing out the best looking equipment I have. This is my vintage Garrard 401 turntable, which according to its serial number, dates from March 1970. I think it's a fabulous looking piece of kit and I prefer it over the earlier 301 model, which I think looks too much like a 1950s kitchen appliance. It's mounted on a modern rosewood plinth, which is fitted with a vintage SME 3009 Series 2 unimproved arm. Now, if you've been watching the channel for a while, you'll know that sound quality is very important to us of Beatles vinyl especially, and I'm always interested in looking at good sounding equipment. But there's one thing we've never done on this channel, which is a specific gear review. But now, thanks to the generosity of the good people at Pure Fidelity, I'm going to do one right now. My workhorse turntable is my project debut Carbon Esprit, which has an Autophon 2M cartridge fitted with one of their blue styluses. I did, in the not too dim and distant past, have this EMT950, which naturally had a TSD15 cartridge. Now, I really love that turntable, but repairs to it and occasionally the cartridge were really expensive. A few months ago, a Canadian company called Pure Fidelity got in touch and asked me if I'd be interested in reviewing their cartridge, which of course I was more than happy to do. Pure Fidelity was founded in 2015 by dedicated audiophile and vinyl enthusiast John Stratton, a man who truly believes in the power of great analog. Pure Fidelity's flagship product is their hybrid turntables, which combine the best elements of high mass turntables and suspended decks, and are, according to reviews I've read, outstanding on every level. The Stratos is a beautifully designed moving coil cartridge, fashioned from an aluminium alloy called Duralumin, and retails for around $2,000. Here are its impressive technical specs, which you can peruse at your leisure by just pausing the video. Of course, being a low output moving coil cartridge, it needs a compatible phono stage, which in my case is this fabulous Riga Phono MC Mark III which is connected into a name Supernight integrated amplifier, which goes out to a pair of neat petite bookshelf speakers and a Tannoy TS10 sub. Now, as good as the TSD-15 was on the EMT, it was very, if not too neutral and was compared to the Stratos like listening to music in black and white. The Stratos by comparison brings out all the colors in the music and has such an impressive soundstage that I spent hours going from record to record, like I was hearing them for the first time. 
Now, I've never been a collector of so-called audiophile pressings, but what I do have are loads of original and vintage pressings, which are the ones I listen to all the time. Not just albums, but singles and EPs too. Now, some of those were a challenge to enjoy on my other systems, but the Stratos finds something beautiful in everything. The highs are crisp and detailed, and the bass is a revelation. It's deep, controlled, and so satisfying and sweet, and that all-important mid-range shines in a way I've never heard before. Everything I've played with this stylus has been given a new lease of life, and I just want to sit here and replay every record in my collection. Now, I understand that spending $2,000 on a stylus is something many, including myself, would never be able to do. But if you ever do manage to be in a position to upgrade your cartridge, I would highly recommend the Stratos. If you'd like to know more about it or take a look at their amazing turntables, just follow the link in the description. Now, something I was really excited to do with the Stratos was to play my DMM pressings and to share them with you. So this is what I've got lined up. Now, the album I've chosen to test is one which we featured in a fun video a few weeks ago on the channel, which hilariously caused a few people to get their knickers in a twist about. And that's the Beatles' White Album, and more specifically, its most popular track, While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Now, we did a similar experiment in our video about the best sounding White Album a while ago, but we're listening for different things here and using a couple of different pressings. Unfortunately, I can't play you the entire track, but I might be able to get away with just a short snippet of the intro. First, let's set the standard with the original 1968 first stereo pressing. Next is the German DMM cutting from 1985, which was cut from an analog source, but rebalanced at the cutting stage by their engineer in Cologne, John Kramer. Unlike the mastering engineers at EMI, who mastered their DMM cuttings with more or less the same characteristics as their regular cuts, Kramer in Germany decided to take advantage of DMM's higher tolerances to increase the sound levels and compression across the board to a point which wouldn't have been tolerated by a lack of cutting. But it's a profile which doesn't suit all of their albums. The early albums from Please Please Me to Rubber Soul do sound in places very artificial, and it's even a bit overblown on Abbey Road. But its dynamic profile suits the White Album perfectly. Thirdly, we've got another DMM pressing from 1991, but this time it's a UK pressing cut from a digital source, the same as the CD in fact. Now the 2012 Remaster, which is an EU pressing, but a non-DMM cut. Finally, there's Giles Martin's 2018 50th anniversary remix. <laughs> Naturally, the original 1968 pressing was very familiar. It's a great, well-balanced mix with George's voice up front as it should be. The German analog DMM sounds fantastic. The sound is so rich and full and it has plenty of detail. The 1991 UK DMM, like the original CD, is very neutral, clean and natural sounding. And whilst the vinyl is as quiet as the German DMM, it isn't as exciting as that pressing. The 2012 remaster has the worst of both worlds, a muted sounding high end, a muddy flaccid bass, and lacks the clarity and excitement of the previous two. Now you'd be forgiven for thinking if you were listening to this song on the 2018 remix that it was Paul's song. Such is the domination of the bass. It takes over and dominates everything in the song. 
Apart from that though, it's very good, especially on George's voice and guitar. But of course, what sounds best is largely a matter of opinion and your own personal preference. So don't take my word for it. Have fun comparing yourself. And please do share your thoughts and opinions with me and everyone else in the comments. Thank you once again to Pure Fidelity for the Stratos. And if you're thinking of upgrading your cartridge and can afford it, I'd highly recommend it. You can find links to that and lots of other interesting things like channel memberships and merchandise and our website in the description. I'll be back next week with a review of a much loved Beatles album we've not covered on the channel before. So I hope I'll have the pleasure of your company for that. But in the meantime, I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching. <laughs>